Good evening. I'm Jim Zirin, and you are watching The Digital Age. As we all know, Congress recently, in an 11th hour deal, approved a measure to extend the debt ceiling, thereby ending any threat to the global economy. But they didn't really resolve the issue. Rather, they kicked the can down the road until next February. What are we going to see next February? As Yogi Berra said, deja vu all over again? Here to help us answer this question is someone in a position to know. If anyone can read the tea leaves, it's our guest tonight, Martin Wolf. Martin Wolf is the chief financial and economic commentator for the London Financial Times. He has been hailed as the premier financial and economic writer in the world. Martin, we're delighted to have you with us. It's a great pleasure. Now, Winston Churchill famously said that America always gets it right after it's tried everything else. Is that what we've recently seen with the circus in Washington? Well, they got it right in the sense that they lifted the debt ceiling and they didn't default in any form. So that was clearly right. Uh, unfortunately, as you said in the introduction, it's clear we're going to have some sort of replay of this. Uh, and again, we can't be sure what will happen. I hope that we won't have any more of this brinkmanship and that the uh, Republicans will realize that the threat of default is... Uh, uh, is not one that can be used by any sensible political party in bargaining. It's just too destructive, but who knows? What is uh, the debt ceiling meant to accomplish? I understand the only other democracy that has a debt ceiling is Denmark, and uh, where it's imposed by the legislature. And here we have it, and it just seems to be a drag on, uh, on what the government needs to do. Well, it's a very good question to an outsider like myself coming from Britain. It's really impossible to understand what it's supposed to accomplish. As I understand it, it was introduced originally to replace a situation in which Congress had to approve every individual debt issue. That was clearly crazy. So they wrapped it all up in this overall debt ceiling. But it obviously creates an impossible situation in the sense that Congress legislates the tax structure and therefore revenue, which depends on the economy as well. Congress uh, legislates spending, which the executive has to implement. It's, uh, it is duty bound to execute the laws. And then it throws in the debt ceiling in addition, which means that it, if it's binding, whenever it's binding, that means that the, the, the executive cannot actually carry out the law to, to, to do the spending, which it's supposed to do. So it seems to me to create an absolutely impossible situation in which whatever happens, uh, the president and the administration is forced to break the law. You have written that the debt ceiling is a nuclear bomb that uh, the United States has aimed at itself. Uh, is it that bad? Yes, I think it, it is potentially that bad. Of course, nobody really knows what would have happened or what would happen if the uh, the debt ceiling became binding and therefore the the government uh, ran out, the federal government ran out of cash. But there are a number of possibilities. They all involve either some form of default, default on spending obligations other than interest, default on interest, which is really a default on the debt, um, or it involves the president going out and borrowing even though he's not allowed to. So all these choices are absolutely horrendous and nobody knows what would happen. Uh, on the last, of course, there will be a constitutional crisis. In theory, there could be a constitutional crisis on any of these alternatives. Um, so it seems to me that it is a nuclear bomb. Clearly, the worst of all from the financial point of view, that may not be the most important of all issues, would be if the US uh, ceased to pay interest and, uh, and its debts were even temporarily to come into question. Given the extraordinarily important role that US treasuries play in the world financial system uh, as the safest form of collateral in every transaction imaginable, the, the consequences of that are really unmeasurable. And uh, I think a nuclear bomb is probably quite a good description. Well, at least uh, two conservative members of uh, Congress, uh, Schweikert uh, in the House of Representatives uh, and uh, Coburn from Arizona in the Senate, uh, argued that uh, we still could uh, pay interest on the debt and uh, we still could uh, redeem bonds and roll them over because that's not affected by the, uh, the limitation. So it's really not so bad if... Uh, 
we default on social security payments and other things. So in other words, we pay the, the Chinese interest on uh, the national debt, but we don't pay our pensioners and uh, our retired people or uh, anyone else to whom we have obligations, veterans. Yes, this is the whole question of prioritization, as it's called. Uh, and it is, from a political point of view at least, a very strange set of priorities they're putting forward. I find that a, a really rather peculiar. Now, the administration would respond in two ways. First, it's actually much more difficult than they suppose. Uh, they get an enormous number of, of payment demands, about 100 million a month, I understand. They have to decide uh, uh, what to do about these. It wouldn't be so easy to take out all the debt interest and then focus everything, uh, all the, all the uh, non-payment in other areas. That's debated and we don't know because it hasn't happened yet. But let us suppose that they were to meet their interest payments so there wouldn't be actually a default, uh, though people who hold US bonds would still be very nervous in this situation, <laughs> let's be clear. But they would then be defaulting on other obligations to hospitals that have treated Medicare payments, to contractors, to social security recipients. Nobody knows actually how that would work out, but that's also a default. Let's be quite clear. These are legal obligations of the federal government to, to pay. So it is a default. It's just not a default on, on, uh, on debt instruments. And there's an additional factor, which is, of course, very important. The government still runs a, a deficit uh, now. It's much smaller than it used to be, about 4% of GDP. If they suddenly had to move to a cash budget, so the deficit eliminated overnight, really overnight, that would have be a tremendous shock to the economy, not as big as it would have been a few years ago, but it would certainly push the economy back into a deep recession, possibly a really deep recession, and that would also be very painful. So the idea that somehow through prioritization all this would turn out to be an utterly insignificant event seems to me quite extraordinary. Well, you referred to a constitutional crisis. The 14th Amendment of uh, the Constitution, of course, says that the debt of the United States shall not be questioned. So why couldn't the president, in the exercise of his uh, faithful execution of the laws, just direct the Secretary of the Treasury to keep issuing debt, the debt ceiling limit notwithstanding? Well, I, I am certainly not. Uh, competent to ask, answer questions about the U.S. Constitution and how the Supreme Court might or might not interpret that clause if it ever got to the Supreme Court. But it, it does seem to me that is what the president should do. In the situation in which whatever he does is contrary to the law, uh, then he has to choose that form of breaking the law which does the least damage to the country. And it seems to me, and this is just common sense, it's not constitutional uh, law, that the least damaging thing the president can do is to go on borrowing. And then I presume the Congress would impeach him uh, and they might well pass the House of Representatives. I don't know. It would go to the Senate and it would fail and you would have a constitutional crisis in which the president is being impeached for trying to keep the United States solvent. That seems to me a very weird situation. Alternatively, I suppose there might be a way, a lawyer would know better than I, of taking him to the, the decision to the Supreme Court, not impeaching him. I don't see how the Supreme Court could rule against the president in this situation. He's clearly doing what he can to keep the, 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 the full faith and credit of the United States intact. How can you say that's unconstitutional? That's his job. I mean, the job of the president is to ensure that the federal government continues to function. Preserving its credit worthiness seems to me a central characteristic of that job. But predicting the Supreme Court is well uh, above my pay grade. I'm sure I can't do it. Well, they, uh, they did uh, rule against President Truman when he seized the steel mills, so uh, they, they do have some precedent for Well, really that's a slightly different thing. I mean, here, he's, he's not doing anything that would involve seizing anything. He's saying, I have obligations to make payments that we have legislated, like Social Security. I have to raise the money for this. I can't raise taxes on my own, so all I can do is borrow. How can that be unconstitutional? All I'm saying is it does seem to me, as an outsider, that whatever happens, if the debt ceiling were to be binding, quite profound constitutional issues would arise and these would be very damaging and any way of resolving them would be bound to be politically and constitutionally very, very dangerous.
Do you think there might be a danger if we had a debt ceiling of a flight from the dollar so that the dollar was no longer the world's reserve currency and it was some basket of Asian currencies or something of that sort? It's very difficult to replace the dollar. Uh, there isn't a good replacement. People ultimately trust the, the US and its currency more than any other rival. The euro has its own problems. That's pretty obvious, as though it's looking better than a year or two ago. The Chinese renminbi is very far from being a currency that can be easily traded, widely held. It's becoming more important. But at the moment, the dollar is clearly the currency most people outside the uh, in the outside world hold, including most governments, uh, and people would want it to remain the one that they hold. However, of course, if it were to be the case, and I'm not saying that would happen, but if it were to be the case that the US were to start missing payments on interest particularly, um, then that would change, uh, inevitably change. People hold the dollar because they think it's safe, and if it ceases to be safe, they would have to find alternatives. Certainly the price of the dollar w is bound to be affected, and above all, the price of Treasury securities is bound to be affected. Um, so uh, we don't know, uh, but interruptions in debt service payments would, I think, be quite serious. Now, if it were an hour or two, and then they resolved it, probably not. If it were a week or two, yes, it begins to get really quite serious. And if it's longer than that, who knows? I don't think this is going to happen. But the fact that we're even talking about this sort of makes it clear that there are, that there are issues here. Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland. Yes, it's, not a, it's a surreal situation. Everybody's known that there is a debt ceiling law. Everybody in the world outside has said, well, that's not serious. They'll always raise it. It would be absurd not to. Um, no one really imagined, I think, until relatively recently you could, that you could be in a situation, and we've now been through this twice quite recently in the last few years, in which this just might not be raised. It's actually a possibility. And after all, still a very large number of Republicans uh, in the House voted against the deal. But uh, U.S. debt now in uh, private hands is something like 37 percent of, uh, of GDP. Suppose we keep borrowing and uh, it gets up to 100 uh, percent. Isn't uh, the United States going to look something like Italy or uh, uh, one of uh, the countries that uh, is uh, so economically uh, in stress? Well, the U.S., I think it's 73 percent now, actually. Yeah, 73. It's already 73. Well, already 73. 37 was the good days right. uh, before the crisis. Uh, um, I just use 37 because that's a number that readily comes to mind. All right, yes, so it's 73. It's the other way around. The other way around. Yes. Um, the, I think the comparisons with Italy don't work. Um, now, it, how much debt can a country bear? That's a very interesting question. What do you define as bearing? First, the U.S. has its own central bank and its own currency, so it can't default. It will not default. Italy actually can default because it doesn't control and cannot create its own currency. That's a very big difference. It's not an accident that most of the debt crises have occurred the big debt crises among advanced countries have occurred in Eurozone countries that no longer have their own currencies. Uh, so the UK, for example, which is a country which, whose debt position is becoming very light to the US, uh, also has very, very low interest rates. The currency adjusts when people don't want to hold it. You get the floating currency. So that makes it much, much safer. So there isn't a default risk with the US dollar. There's an inflation risk. That's a slow risk, very, very distant. That means that the US can afford much more debt than a country like Italy. Second, the US is a much faster growing economy than Italy, and probably two to three times faster. Uh, now, that's very important because in these debt calculations, you've got debt on the top and GDP below. So the denominator GDP really matters. And if it's growing two or three times as fast, you can support much more debt. And finally, because of these, this combination, the real interest rate that the U.S. has to pay, or the interest rate that the U.S. has to pay, is certainly going to be lower than Italy's. Um, and that, again, makes it much, much easier to manage. On the basis of the recent Congressional Budget Office forecasts, um, they're suggesting that by 2038, which is a very long time from now, uh, the, um, the ratio of uh, debt held by the public to GDP will be 100%. That I regard as moderately uncomfortable, but certainly not a crisis for the US. And it would actually be very easy, if you look at their figures, and I've recently been writing about it, to change the, the, pr the forthcoming profile of debt to, to bring it down 
even below the starting point. So I'm fairly relaxed about the, the next 25 years of US debt history. Some people look at the next thousand years, you know, these sort of infinite lifetime models and they produce the result that the US is completely bankrupt. I don't take those sorts of calculations all that seriously there. They depend very much on the nature of the assumptions that are made. But the US is not Italy, it's not Greece, its problems are very different. And the most important issue, I think, to the US is not its debt position, but its growth and its employment. Well, but we're running up all this debt, are we not, because of our entitlements program. We always hear so much about entitlements, Social Security, Medicare, Obamacare now, uh, that uh, um, people suggest need some reform. Uh, is, is that so? I mean, what can be done about that? We have a retirement age of 65. We uh, have many more people being covered under Obamacare. Uh, how do we stop this uh, health care cost spiral? Well, there are two things about this. First, about the debt today. Um, debt obviously has risen very, very rapidly in the last four or five years. It's, it's just about doubled relative to GDP. This has nothing, zero, to do with entitlement spending. It has to do partly with decisions to cut taxes in the uh, Bush era. The, everybody knew that the Bush tax cuts were unaffordable, and they were. So they, they undermined the long-term fiscal solvency of the US, not dramatically. Then there were, of course, some large unfunded spending on wars. There was one uh, very significant- Like about $1.3 trillion. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so that's, that, that's not, uh, in the context of the US, that's only about seven or 8% mm -hmm. of GDP, but still, it's a significant element. And then, of course, uh, there was Medicare D, which was again unfunded and people have forgotten about, which was introduced again under the Bush administration. That's prescription then, drugs. Prescription drugs, exactly. Though that was, a, but that was a, that's a part of it and it should never have been done in that form. It's very costly. But the biggest issue, reason by far for the sudden doubling of debt was the completely unexpected financial crisis, which collapsed GDP far below what was expected. Today, US GDP is about 15% below its trend up to, to 2007. So it's a massive, massive reduction in GDP, reduction in revenue, increase in spending on unemployment, social security, and things of this kind, uh, Medicaid, Medic, uh, aid for relatively poor people, but mainly uh, it was just the collapse in revenue. That shot up the debt. So let's be clear, it's not entitlement spending that has led to the recent rise in debt. It has nothing to do with it. Now, if you look forward, it is clear, if you look at the Congressional Budget Office's forecasts, that the big element in the rise in spending that is prospective over the next 25 years is, is health-related spending. It's, about, it's an increase uh, of, of about um, four or percent of GDP, something like that, if I remember correctly. And well, that, healthcare spending is now about 18% of GDP. That's the total. But and, the, and then it's going, it's projected to go up to 30% yes, of GDP. That's right. But most of that is, uh, even in the US, about half of that is private spending. And that will continue. So the, the government share of this is much, uh, obviously much, uh, much smaller. But the point is, there will be a rise on their forecasts. The rise will occur because the population is aging. That accounts for about half of it. And the remaining rise will occur because of the assumption that there will be health cost inflation, which is partly actually new treatments and all the rest of it, and partly steadily rising costs. Now, my view is very simple. The U.S could afford to, to pay for this. Um, Social Security is a much smaller issue. It's, it's a much smaller increase. It is an increase, but it's much smaller and easier to handle through changes in retirement ages or uh, changes in cost indexation, that, which they are discussing. So health is clearly the big issue. Well, there, there, are, there are two broad solutions to that. You can raise taxes. Uh, relatively modest increases in taxation, but they will be above the level that the US has been used to paying in taxes to the federal government because the obligations are increasing. Or you cut these programs in one way or another. Uh, there are obviously ways of doing that. Um, since the US health system is so much more costly than other systems, you and you, it would in principle, it seems to me, be possible to deliver probably pretty good care 
paying less by just simply imposing more cost controls. Um, you basically pay people whatever it costs, and that doesn't, isn't how it works in other systems where the government bears down on cost much more. So that's one way you can, you can curb costs or you can actually ration care um, well, we were rationing health care uh, before Obamacare by simply not covering people. Well, there's all, there are many ways you, that indeed. Not covering people is one way of rationing care. Having large co-pays, co-payments uh, is another way of rationing care. Basically, uh, making sure that people run out of money. Uh, that's one way of doing it. Well, there are other ways of doing it, which admittedly are more bureaucratic. What we do in the UK is that the state pays for certain treatments, and but we have a uh, a body which uh, of professional ex experts which look at what treatments are cost effective and what are not. And there are some very expensive drugs uh, whose benefits are seen as marginal that are. National Health Service simply doesn't cover. If you want them, you have to go and pay for them yourself. So that they're outside the system that can be covered. And we're, we're quite ruthless about this. I think we spend less on keeping people alive in, uh, in the very last year of life. A huge part of the cost of a health service is just keeping people alive as they're dying. And in most other countries, the extreme efforts that seem to be taken in the US are not adopted. So that saves quite a but bit of money. But then you have uh, what we've uh, called here pejoratively uh, death panels, uh, which will, bureaucrats will make decisions of life and death uh, over people as to uh, who will get what treatment and who will be sent home to die. The, well, the, the, the decisions about what treatment is offered in, 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 you should separate the two things. What treatment is offered to patients when they're dying, what extreme efforts you take, how, what sort of interventions you take, are in all countries that I'm familiar with taken by doctors. Uh, the difference is that in most countries, the, f the fear of malpractice suits is smaller, and they make what they think is a reasonable medical judgment on the benefits of extreme efforts to, s to keep people alive as against letting nature take its course. We what we're talking about here is really the decision on how far you intervene to keep somebody alive who is in the process of dying. The, the second issue, which is bureaucratic, is indeed what sort of drugs, and this is not death panels, these, no, there are no bureaucrats in any country that I know of who sit around and decide whether A should die or, or not. That's a complete fantasy. But what happens mm -hmm. is, uh, okay, you've got a drug who, this is um, just an imagination, but imagine a drug, a course of treatment costs half a million dollars and the chances that it will pr preserve your life are very small. You've got a cancer or so forth. In many systems, the decision will be made, we can't afford this treatment. It's, it's the, the benefits are too tiny against other things we could do. This is a decision taken, uh, obviously, by the system in different ways. In that sense, bureaucrats decide it. Of course, uh, the individual concerned, if they can, can raise the money. And so we're back to where the U.S. is now. It's price that rations you. It's no different. So the so-called death panels uh, really m kick you back into having to put up the money your, yourself. No one needs to uh, be in a situation where anybody other than the doctors decides whether the medical treatment uh, of somebody in extreme position should, be, should uh, go ahead. But very, very expensive treatments, they have to be rationed. And this will get uh, probably a bigger problem in time as, as the, the pharmaceutical companies create more and more treatments, many of which may really be beyond our ability to provide to everybody. Uh, moving away from uh, death to perhaps a brighter subject, what is your midterm outlook for the U.S. economy? Well, I've been moderately optimistic about the U.S. economy, in fact. Provi let's assume for the moment that there are no more fiscal disasters, that a budget is agreed more or less in line with the sequester, um, with a m modest adjustment. There's no problem with the debt ceiling. I think the sequester is far too brutal. It imposes very significant short and long-run costs on the U.S., but uh, you could do fiscal policy much better than this. But uh, I don't think it need affect the economy dramatically. The huge cut in fiscal deficit has already occurred. There's been a massive decline. So, so fiscal drag, the reduction in demand from fiscal tightening has largely occurred, particularly this year. So uh, the fiscal position will not tighten much, so much more. 
uh, I think the U.S. has a lot going for it. There's been a lot of deleveraging since the crisis of 2007-08. Uh, the housing market has, has corrected and house construction is picking up again. Uh, you've got a, an energy revolution, which clearly is very beneficial to um, a lot of producers in this country across a wide range, particularly in, uh, in manufacturing. In this situation, provided the uncertainty from Washington disappears, investment should pick up, by um, corporate investment. It needn't be terribly strong, but it should pick up. If you add all these things together and you assume nothing terrible happens in the world, it seems to me quite plausible we'll begin to get a real recovery in the U.S. with growth 3% plus uh, for some years. That assumes they make a deal in February. That assumes that a deal that they don't do anything insane. Uh, and I'm assuming, in fact, from the recent experience, they will not do anything the same. So I have a question for you. Do you think February will be deja vu all over again, to yes. quote Yogi Berra? Yes, I think it will be. I think they will get to the wire and they will agree again to raise the debt ceiling. And then maybe we'll be talking May. We'll be talking May. They'll kick the can down the road again. Probably. Martin Wolf, this has been just perfect. It's been delightful. And thank you so much for coming by. It's a pleasure. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more about the digital age. Please visit our website at www.digitalage.org. For the digital age, I'm Jim Zirin. Good night and all the best.